Hello and welcome. Rick B. Cotter coming to you February issue of the Risk Management Monthly Show. We've got some special guests today, and I'll introduce her in a second. But first, I want to introduce you to Kevin Clower. Kevin was with us last month. Kevin is a, a emergency physician and an attorney and has been a friend of mine for many decades and is just an extraordinarily bright person. And um I'm, I know you'll enjoy him. The other person who's been here about six months now is um, Rachel Linder. Rachel is a um, doc out of the Mayo Clinic here in Phoenix and uh, went to ASU Medical School. Uh, I mean, um, law school. Is that law yep. school you went yep. to? Right. Uh, she's actually from Minnesota, where all those Mayo people come from and then they spread them all over the country and plant them in so she was planted here but in any case rachel has been very good at uh looking up the literature on this and has been speaking at asap on a variety of medical legal topics we're coming up uh, to my one year anniversary rick it's hard to believe i i thought it was about six months and for those of you who didn't get the message previously greg is retired formerly finally uh retired and we wish him the best uh but our special guest today is a guest that greg and i had on four years ago you think uh gita I, maybe I, it, I it was maybe three or four uh, a long time ago we found out about gita uh through a friend of a friend kind of thing that gita had had a um really nasty experience in the medical legal realm and as a result, decided that she would work with physicians who were being um, litigated and try to help them get through this process uh, as with that with as many with with as many minor wounds as possible or as few wounds as possible. So, Gita, would you welcome first of all, and Gita, give us a little bit about your background uh, because you were at. Brown in the emergency department, and you have transitioned out, um, and you are doing this pretty much full time now. I think, but you're also on MRAP. <laughs> well, I yeah, I'm doing a lot of of audio work these days. Um, yes, yeah, so I actually I'm still in the ER per diem. Um, I work a couple of days at Brown's um, Student Health in an urgent care capacity. I work for MRAP, which is Emer Emergency Medicine Reviews and Perspectives. I do um, the Urgent Care podcast. We just started a product called UC Max. And uh, I now, a couple of days a week, am doing coaching and counseling for physician defendants. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm actually hoping to make more time to do that work because the demand is is actually great. Um, and I have found myself um, needing to try to up my availability for people who ask for uh, room and can't, I don't have it right now. Uh, do you want to go through a little bit of the uh, world's most horrible malpractice case against one person? <laughs> and, and, which sure. really caused you to uh, want to do this work. Yeah, for sure. So um, I graduated, let's see, from medical school back in the day, 2001 is when I started working as an attending. And it was about five years out of residency. So 2006, I was working as a nocturnist in a community hospital. And that meant that I was generally the only physician in the hospital at night. So I would, it was pre-hospitalist days. So I would take care of codes on the floor and then come back to the ER and then go up to LND and maybe deliver a baby if OB didn't come in in time, that kind of thing. And it was really, um, it, it was terrifying and exhilarating in equal measure, I would say. Um, it was, it was a, a really hard job, but I really loved doing it. And one night I took care of a, a young woman who came in, she was 30 years old, she was an engineer and she came in with, <clears throat> excuse me, not to get into the actual case case itself, but very, very confusing constellation of symptoms. I spent a lot of time with this woman trying to sort things out. I, I knew I didn't have a great handle on what was going on. I imaged her. I woke up a consultant 
And then um, I wound up discharging her. She improved. And I had this plan in place that she was going to see a consultant a couple of hours later, first thing in the morning. And then she didn't make it there. She had instead a very large cerebellar stroke and uh, got taken to the, I'm so sorry, and got taken to a tertiary care center. So I didn't know anything had happened uh, until I was named in a lawsuit a few months later. And I was really completely floored. Um, I wasn't expecting it. No one had ever talked to me about what happened once you were actually named. You know, you got a lot of risk management stuff, but nothing about, oh, here's your, you know, here's the complaint. This is what you do next. I had zero idea. And that really was my entrance into this really uh, just foreign world of pain. I'd like just never anticipated this kind of suffering um, that would happen once the wheels of litigation started turning. Because the first thing they do is tell you like, okay, don't talk to anybody. And I had no idea what to do with these emotions. I was, you know, I felt horrible guilt over what had happened. I didn't know what happened. I didn't know how I missed something, but something happened. It was definitely on my watch. And so I felt terrible about what to the patient. I was thinking I wasn't as good a doctor maybe as I thought I was. I wanted to leave medicine. Um, it was truly awful. And then as the case started to unfold, you know, this is a young person with significant damages and she had been an engineer. And so the demand was astronomical. So and I live in a very plaintiff friendly state and their initial demand was $28 million. And I was the sole physician defendant. And I just didn't, I didn't know what to do with myself. Um, and the case would, you know, just went on, weeks turned into months, months turned into years. And then in 2011, I did go on trial for the first time. And I just was such a mess, like such a complete total wreck that they had had to assign me an attorney to be like my handler. Like I had my, <laughs> my, the main attorney on the case and they assigned me this junior attorney whose job it was, was just basically like to keep me from falling apart and like teach me how to perform at a deposition. And it was like a, I was a special case. Um, and somehow I made it through that and I, I testified okay on my behalf and I wound up um, winning. There was a defense verdict, uh, but I didn't want to go back to work. You know, at, by that point, I had gotten to this place of like just significant, just depression, anxiety. I It spilled over into everything, into my home life. And I didn't want to be a doctor anymore, except that I had loans. So I had to keep going in. And um, I just really didn't know how to take care of myself or what to do with all of these emotions. And I felt like I might be the only person who ever felt this way because I knew there were numbers about people getting sued, but I'd never... No one talked about it. And then in uh, 2015, to make a long story even longer, well, right after trial, it, it became apparent that they were going to appeal. And I thought the appeal was stupid. It had it had nothing to do with the merits of the case. It was all about um, an expert witness and this uh, assertion that my attorney had um, biased the jury against him unduly. And I thought that was dumb. And yet <laughs> it went through all the layers of the courts. And then in 2015, so four years later, my verdict was finally overturned. And I fairly lost my mind. <clears throat> um, I just, I, I honestly, at that point was so just broken by this whole thing. I had been, now this is since 2006 is when I saw this patient Years and years and years and years of just suffering, isolation, depression, anxiety, not knowing how to continue on at work. I think I showed up at work and did a good job or enough, but it was, you know, people knew I, I wasn't, I just wasn't myself. And so um, I really was getting to a point where things were getting um, fairly dangerous, I would say. And uh, I hadn't talked to really anybody but my spouse. I never saw a therapist. I just kind of did what doctors do, which is just swallow everything and just keep showing up at work. Uh, and then after that phone call with my attorney, when he said we were going back to trial, I like I fairly lost my mind. And I had this um, 
epiphany, I would say at that point. And I'd been thinking for some time, like, I'm not doing well. I'm not doing well. I'm not doing well. Something has to change. And it was really after this phone call that I just, um, you know, cried for a long time. And then I sat up and I was like, okay, they're going to make me go to trial again. But with God as my witness, I am never going to be like this again. Like somebody out there has to know how to do this better than me. I'm like, you know, I, I am on my knees. Like something has to change. Like I just need to get help from someone outside of my own head. Uh, and that was really when it all started. And, you know, I went upstairs that day and I read a book that someone had given me because they knew I wasn't, I, they knew I wasn't doing well. And they gave me this book, another attending had given me a book called When Good Doctors Get Sued. And I liked the title um, and I would look at it once in a while, but I had never read it. And um, I went upstairs that day and I sat in my bed and I took it. It was living in my bedside table. And I took it out and I started reading it and um, it felt like this indulgence, but also the first step to saying like, okay, I am open to some other ways of thinking about this. Um, and that's how I got started. Well, that's a heartwarming story. And I'll, I'll just jump in at the, because there's an awkward pause here. I, I hear you, and because we have some video here as well, I see you reliving the experience. And I'm I'm sorry you have to do that, but I'm glad you're doing it for the benefit of others. And absolutely, this is what so many others go through in isolation. You said something that was so important that you didn't know if anyone else or how many people had gone through this before. Unfortunately, a lot of people do, and everyone is in isolation because mm -hmm. of the risk of discoverability of the conversations that you have, and also potentially exposing yourself to the belief that, wow, maybe everyone's going to think I'm a bad doctor. Well, you're not, you know, professional yeah. liability and the tort of negligence and legal procedure has very little to do with the practice of medicine. And that is unfortunate, but that is what a lot of physicians really don't realize. And it really hits them so hard. So thank you for your courage and thank you for helping others. Thank you. I appreciate that. So, yeah, it was really with the starting of, of reading that book that I realized that um, there were different ways of thinking about this and that maybe the problem wasn't entirely me. Um, and so one thing led to another, like one book begat other books. And then I really started going, you know, whole hog with like, uh, you know, the first self-help books of my life. You know, I, before that, I would have said like, that's fine for other people, but not for me. Um, but then I, you know, I read, I would read them. I took notes. I tried all the exercises that I also thought were for other people, but not for me um, and found that they were actually quite helpful. Um, I wound up, uh, I wound up getting a therapist um, and that was years and years and years after it should have started. Um, but that was really a seminal event. Um, I started talking to more peers and colleagues. Um, and then I sort of started this path towards just really not just getting back to feeling normal, but actually trying to course correct um, the way that I've been feeling about medicine in general, um, working towards just being sort of an overall happier human being, making decisions that benefited myself and my family. All of that kind of came with every step getting better along the way. And all that time I was learning also about tort law and how to be a better defendant, um, how to acquire this skill set and mindset required to be successful in litigation. And I did discover along the way that that skill set and that mindset, it can be learned and it can be taught. And so by the time I wound up going back to trial the second time in 2018, I was a completely different defendant, first of all, um, and a much happier person in medicine. Um, you know, I had been so burned out and one of the things that I found was, you know, in learning about like I don't know, everything from like resilience training to um, mindfulness approaches to, to tackling burnout and those things. Like I just really learned about paying attention to the everyday interactions I have with patients, um, finding a lot more meaning in them. Uh, it was really very 
instrumental, I think, um, to just be able to take a step back and look at the good that I was doing on any given day um, and reminding myself that the work that I do matters and that so much of it is more than this one case, which is what I think a lot of us get caught up in is the one case that didn't go well, that case that didn't go badly, the case that we get sued for. We all get sucked into feeling like that is the sum total of our career. Um, and it's obviously not. And so that was when I actually, I went to Brown because um, I'd been in the community for all those years. I joined Brown's faculty in 20, I think around 2016, like some sometime in that next year. Um, and just as it happens, I wound up being their educational technology person. And that's why I learned how to blog and podcast and that kind of stuff. And so before trial in 2018, I started thinking like, well, I've learned all these things um, and I feel like people should know a lot of what I've learned and I know that this is lacking. And so what I started doing was interviewing doctors about their experiences in litigation and then also attorneys and psychologists. And I assembled these things into a podcast curriculum, which I didn't release until after 2018, after my trial was over. Um, but um, that was how, I think that's how Rick and I got connected in the first place was after so that came out and started getting passed around a lot. Um, and so that was, that was, I think where we, where we first met Rick. During the pass around phase, the early yeah. pass around phase. <laughs> During the early pass around phase of the, yeah. Cause I never like, I mean, I just made this thing and I put it out there for free, but it's not like I advertised it or anything. Um, but it did get passed around a lot of it. I think, you know, there's 11 episodes. Um, and then I just, I just hit 75,000 downloads of the curriculum. Um, I know now it's used in um, a couple of graduate courses. I get students, I mean, I get emails from students periodically like, oh, I got to sign this in my master's in healthcare leadership course. And I know it's in like two undergraduate classes <laughs> and um, hospital systems use it. Um, I know that um, some insurance companies use it in their like toolkit. I think ASAP has it in their toolkit. Um, so it's been really gratifying and it's also led to a lot of people sort of reaching out and saying like, oh, you know, this really helped me feel less alone. Um, I had all those same feelings, but just hearing people's voices talking about their own stories just makes me feel like I don't need to be so ashamed and so isolated. You know, did you ever have any uh, interaction with Louise Andrew? Yes. Yes. Oh my gosh. So Louise is actually in the podcast. Actually, Rick, you're in the podcast. I, I think after we met, like there is, you're in the episode about trial and settlement. You tell a story um, in there, but yeah, Louise was a really important resource to me. I think she is, there are two people that I consider to be real pioneers in the whole um, field, if you'll call it that, of litigation stress. Uh, the first is Sarah Charles, who is a psychiatrist who is she was sued in federal court in the 1970s, I believe, and then wrote a book called Defendant um, and actually was the first person to start doing research into the effect of litigation stress on physicians. And then Louise Andrew was really the champion, I think, in emergency medicine. Um, mm -hmm. She really did a, a lot of um, she also MDJD um, did a, a lot of writing, teaching, trying to advocate for policy change. And so she's actually in the podcast. I, I lean on her very heavily. Um, she did a, a lot of work. Um, and so she's in a number of the episodes and she's just phenomenal. Yeah, she had, uh, I think, a fairly negative medical experience and um, it helped precipitate her interest in getting into the law. And she does, you know, what you do uh, in terms of helping people through the process. Uh, but she's, yes. of a, of, frankly, of another generation. And it's great that a young um, new person is coming along to run with this baton. Yeah. Because well, we were just be talking done. before we went on, and I'm not as young as, <laughs> I'm not that young. <laughs> But um, but yes, I think that um, I really do hope sort of standing on the shoulders of uh, Louise and Sarah, Sarah Charles is also interviewed in the podcast. Um, I'm really hoping that we can make some inroads in terms of changing how it is that we talk about litigation and teach about litigation um, or the fact that we really don't teach much about it at all other than 
perhaps, as I said before, like the risk management like or, um, you know, here's a, the once every couple of years, a, this is what a deposition is or the anatomy of a lawsuit. More open, honest conversations about the experience of litigation, how it differs, you know, how it really does require a different mindset um, than we've been trained to, um, to think with in medicine. And there are, you know, it's never going to be a great experience. Like no one's ever going to be super happy that this happened to them. However, it does not have to be as singularly devastating an experience as it is for many, many physicians, because what we understand now is that with just the little bit of research that we have is that physicians have not to be too blunt, we have a suicide problem. And there is good data to suggest that litigation and the fear of litigation or the aftermath of litigation are drivers of suicide in physicians. And we ignore that at our peril. Um, and so, so yes, like standing on the work that Louise did, that Sarah did, there's, there's, there's so much more work to be done um, but I think we're finally getting to a place where we're ready to admit uh, that we have a problem um, and start to think more about what is it that we have control over in this whole storm? Um, what can we modify for our own, um, you know, working externally for changes, tort reform, all those other external things that we can talk about. There are things that we can do for ourselves and our people um, that I think would change us a lot. Rachel, any thoughts? Yeah. So I'm curious, you've put a lot of thought into this, where you think the we should be putting our effort into preparing <clears throat> physicians for, you know, better processing this litigation stress, you know, where we should be putting those efforts in what should it be medical school should it be residency or should it be you know once physicians face this that we're providing resources for them at that stage um because you know part of me thinks it should be you know everybody gets exposed to this in medical school so we just normalize it at the outset and you know don't let somebody kind of get hit with this and then be in your position where they just you know it's a 10 ton truck that they just don't know what to do with. But at the same time, I know there's just an absolute ton of pressure on medical schools to be cutting the curriculum, you know, competing with PA schools or whatever to get to three years. I was just in a discussion where, you know, the, the OB curriculum is now like two weeks long, you know, they get a day yeah. to learn the cervical or like an hour to learn the cervical exam. That's it. So like, I, I know that that time is increasingly precious. And so the idea of adding something to that is maybe not, it's, it's uh, going to be harder than ever to try to put that in there. And so I'm just, you know, you've thought a lot about this. Where do you think realistically yeah. is the best place to try to, to prepare people for well, potential litigation stress? It, it's a really good point. Um, and I'm certainly not suggesting that we try and like incorporate law school into med school or anything like that. That's obviously not going to work. Um, I, I think that it can be more longitudinal and more subtle um, than like a course or something like that. Like I don't, I don't think the changes that we need to make are necessarily going to be things that are going to add a lot of curricular time. So what I mean by that is this. So just thinking in general about stress and uh, whether stress is harmful, right? So there's been a lot of really interesting like cognitive neuroscience research about stress. And um, there's a great book by uh, Kelly McGonigal, um, who's at Stanford called The Upside of Stress. And so in general, the, what she says is that the science basically tells us that stress, even litigation stress, is most likely to be harmful when there are three things that are true. One is that you feel inadequate to it. Two is that it isolates you from other people. And three is that it feels just meaningless or completely against your will. So if we think about litigation like this, there are ways that we can make people feel adequate to it in terms of just 
mitigating their anxiety, teaching them what they need to know about, as I said before, the skill set and the mindset. And just like even just opening their eyes to the fact that those are things that to be learned, that they could read about in their own time, but that those things exist. The second part, this whole isolating you from other people is where I think that we're really going to be able to make a lot of impact. And the third about it being meaningless, that's a little more difficult to sell. But I, when I talk and teach about this, I do talk about this concept of like post-traumatic growth and how there are things that you can take out of it that were, you know, where it sort of turns into a crucible. But if we just break this down, like I, when I think about this, there are really four, um, buckets, if you will, that we have to think about. So sort of, I, you're right. I've thought about this a lot. I, I talk about this all the time. The four ways that we need to adapt um, are in the psychology of the physician themselves, uh, the culture of medicine, then the naivete of the physician entering the system and then finally, the system itself, right? So these are the, these are the four things that sort of combine to make litigation stress this really singularly awful experience for the physician, and really like no other stressor that they'll encounter in their career. So, if you think about the psychology of the physician, right? So in general, obviously we're all different, but in general, we're talking about people with um, perfectionism. Um, they take a great deal of personal responsibility. Um, for outcomes, even in cases of systemic failures. So like, look at Dr. Lorna Breen. Um, we're used to being the expert in the room. We have a very, um, very strong ego in terms of the way we think and um, our refusal to change habits of thought that are very well ingrained because they've served us so well. And we want things to work rationally and scientifically. And part of our real core identity is that we like sacrificed our life for medicine, Right. And then there's medical culture, which is also perfectionist, perfectionistic and um, this whole blame and shame culture of medicine. Like we talk about M&M conference, like the ABCs of M&M are accused, blame, criticize, right? Um, we have this culture that asking for help is um, weak or even dangerous and that um, emotional distress is a sign of weakness. And, uh, you know, medicine expects us to self-sacrifice also, like that's just the way, that's just the way it is, right? So then you take this person who has been like ostensibly raised by, for like, you know, over a decade in the system of training, and now that's where you work and you live and that's how you think. And you take that person and you put them into litigation where they have no idea what the hell is going on. They have had no visible role models in the process. They have not seen any of their attendings or anyone go through it. They come in expecting law to work like medicine. Like things are supposed to make sense. It's supposed to be like evidence collection and thereby we have this conclusion. They don't even know what they don't know. And they are completely blind to whatever deliberate emotional manipulation is baked into the process. And they take it very, very, very personally. Um, and then that fourth bucket is the system where the, you know, the physician doesn't understand the system, but the plaintiff's attorneys do, and they are very well versed in physician psychology and the whole process leverages guilt, um, emotion, their gullibility, their inexperience, the judge, the jury, they don't have medical expertise, the medical experts, there's basically no standards, no consequences, um, and so this physician who has like no idea about any of this, they're used to being in control. They have no control. And you put this all together. All right. So you put that all together. Now you have this physician who has dedicated their life to medicine, years of training, um, the expense, their life resolves, revolves around medicine. And now you accuse them of significantly harming someone they feel responsible. You're telling them you're bad at what you dedicated your life to. You ruined your patient's life instead of helping them. You tell them you can't talk about it. They don't understand what's going on. They're worried about losing their assets. The process lasts forever. What do you think is going to happen? 
And so the worst thing we do for our residents, our med students, our learners is that nobody models what it's like to go through the process. It is absolutely invisible to them. And they do not understand when they walk into that room, when they walk into their first meeting with their lawyer or their insurer, they have not clue number one that they are showing up with one set of skills, but they're being asked to play a completely different game. Like they're showing up in their tennis whites with a racket and wondering why everybody is like running around with a ball and bouncing it and throwing it in a net. They have no idea. Um, And that's where I think that we can really start to make inroads is just opening up this conversation, talking about like what it's like to go through it, how you might expect to feel when we take the isolation out of it, the shame is going to go with it. That was a long winded answer to your question. So but obviously I get evangelical about this. All now. right. So I'm going to push back. I'm going to push back for some specifics then. So it okay. sounds like at the end there, you said, you know, we're kind of doing a disservice because we're not, we're not going to the learners and showing them this, but like, what's mm-hmm. the model to show them that? Are you relying on them finding your podcast or are you mm-hmm pushing for a model that puts this into the curriculum in some standardized fashion. And one of the reasons I say that is I'm kind of, I have one of my own papers pulled up that is in submission right now, but you know, in that we, we quote something that says, you know, some study that um, a one out of 25. So it's not a huge percentage, but one out of 25 of malpractice claims involve residents as a responsible mm-hmm. party. So I think that's higher than most people would think, you know, one out of 25, I think a lot of residents don't think that they're, they can be named in a lawsuit, you know, they don't have right. any pockets. So what's the point, but still that's a pretty sizable chunk and 70% of residents grade their own medical legal knowledge as poor or terrible. And 97% of them think that medical legal curricula, uh, that, the medical legal curriculum is at least moderately important to their training. So yeah, they think they have terrible knowledge. 97% of them think it's important <laughs> to their training and you know, they want it. So should it be in there? And like, yes. if so, what does that look like? I think so. I, I to, to get more concrete about it, I think residency is the sweet spot. I think okay. that doing it, I think introducing the idea in medical school is important. Um, and they do have, you know, electives and this and that, but I think introducing the idea, just letting them understand like this is actually part of the process and that, you know, once, once it does occur, you're going to be thinking differently about things, these things. But I talk to, I work with a lot of medical students too. It's interesting how some of them from the very beginning are, their decisions are fear-based. Like they're worried about like, which, which specialties are, are more likely to get sued. I don't want to go into that one. And so having conversations early about this just being an occupational hazard and like just just trying to change their mindset away from living in fear of this all the time and having that be the defining factor of their careers is I think that's where we should start in medical school. In residency, yes, this is the time to get concrete. And it's, you know, should it be a more regular part of, uh, you know, if you're doing weekly conferences or whatever? Yeah, maybe. But when it is that we're taught, when we have those risk management lectures, when we talk, because we talk a lot about documentation, right? We talk a lot about how we respect patients. We talk a lot about those conversations. We talk a lot about like how not to get sued, right? That somehow like that's not, it's that's it's not a standalone part of the curriculum, but somehow that bleeds its way in there, I would say. Like, would you agree? Yeah. So if we can do that, we can also bleed into there, like, and when it does happen, this is kind of how it goes, right? If we talk about a case, if we're talking about like a medical legal case and, and, and doing it from this really analytical perspective, we can at that same time have an open conversation about what that, what did the experts say? What was, what is that like? What are the criteria to be an expert? Like what should someone, you know, having a, a little more, um, meet in the discussion about the human side, what to expect, what you can't expect in terms of it being this process that works like medicine. We just need to take the voodoo out of it for them, you know? And I think that, I think residency is really the place to do it, but making sure that we bleed it into the conversations that we're having on a regular basis. Plus my appeal really is to the people who have been through it, who are attending just please start talking about it. You know, yeah. if you're going through it, 
it's okay to it's okay to say it's happening. Like I, you know, making this distinction between whether you can talk about what's happening to you in the lawsuit versus like all the details of your case, like you should be talking about it. I invited my residents to come watch me testify. Like at my second trial, like I knew what I was doing. I was like, you guys should come. Like, when else are you going to get an opportunity to watch this? Um, and not all of them, but some, a good handful of them did. Um, and they said it was one of the most eye-opening days of their life um, in their medical careers. Like they just, they had no idea. But that's what we need. We need people who are willing to bring the residents into this process, to to talk to them, to watch them going through it. Um, to show them that it's not something to be like that you, the fact that we shroud this in shame and yet almost every single one of us will go through this at some point. They're just, it doesn't add up. So we should be approaching this very differently with them. Yeah, I've got a a quick thought and I know that this is, we could go on forever. So I'll try not to go on forever myself, but love the conversation and Rachel outstanding, um, comments in response to Gita, I would say in residency or earlier, I think it's the time to address the foundational issue that we do expect perfectionism. We are all trained to aspire to perfectionism when it should be the pursuit of excellence and nothing is perfect, including us. It is a recipe for for failure and personal disaster. And I think we can start there and also give them a little background of the professional liability experience, I agree. But when you have an audience that's truly engaged is when they have been, they're either, they either know someone who's been named or they've been mm-hmm. named. And then I think you can really, really, um, really engage them in knowledge acquisition so that they really understand the process. Before that point, I think a lot of people and having done a fair amount of this work as well, they think, until it happens to them, that this is what happens to other people who are not as good mm-hmm. as me. And so they're not as receptive at that point. Although I agree with you that let's go ahead and set the stage and let's get rid of this concept of perfectionism because no one will be perfect. And then when they really need us, like you have done, you lean in with heavy education and very personalized education to get them through this with not only litigation support from a stress standpoint, but also depot and trial testimony preparation. Yeah. Yeah. A thousand percent. Thank you for that. It is no. that this culture of perfectionism that I think we're talking about in a lot of different ways. Um, and I, I really do believe you make the statement that um, people feel like it's not going to happen to them. It happens to people who aren't as good as, you know, as they are. Um, and this is where I think it really matters to have the knowledge that your role models have done this. Um, and so, you know, knowing that, um, you know, there are people that I interview in the podcast who, you know, they're division directors and you know, department chairs who say things that's like, oh, yeah, I was sued seven times. It was awful. It was this. It was, but nobody knows that. Like, none of their learners would know that. I think it would make a very big difference if people were, you know, more open about the fact that about not just like it did happen. And it actually, it's harder for people, I think, when they say, like, it did, it happened and it was no big deal, um, which I, I think maybe once you've kind of gotten, you know, gone through the ringer a few times, it does become less impactful. But it sets people up with this feeling of, like, this should be no big deal for me. And so I really mean, like, if you have been through it and you have something to say about how it felt, why it felt that way, and Um, can model some in some way being a role model of resilience. I think that's what we need. I think even less than that, we can start addressing that culture of perfectionism by sharing, not just, you know, when we were sued, but when we made mistakes, you know, in clinical practice, I have of course stories that, you know, about that, where I, you know, realized after the fact, oh my gosh, I really, I really screwed that up. I, gosh, I ordered a CT on the wrong patient. They went and had it. I, you know, I can, the stories are probably too long winded to get into here, but you know, things that I did that later I realized, wow, that was, that was a mistake and I could have hurt that patient or, you know, I really shouldn't have done that. And I've had the opportunity to tell those to people and they, you know, look at me like, I can't believe you told me that, or I can't believe you said that in the setting. And, you know, I'm really kind of breaking the norm by telling that, but, you know, I think if we all did that, it would really change that culture and, you know, push the envelope as far as also uh, 
sharing the the story of when I got sued. So I don't think you have to wait until you get sued to do it because we all have the stories, I think, of when I screwed up, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And handling that from a human perspective, I think is something that we need to get better at too, because there's even just an adverse event or making a mistake or this whole concept of error. Um, and this very, very, like, you know, it's a really heavy emotional burden to carry those things around without feeling like you can talk to somebody else about it. So setting up systems where, you know, peer support, I think is really a critical thing in sort of all layers of this, um, having spaces where, again, not necessarily built in the curriculum, but like having critical incident support teams or um, whatever you can think of at your institution so that people know like when they do make a mistake, when, not if, when they do make a mistake or there is an adverse event, not just litigation, but like there are people who are skilled at both listening and guiding you through these tough things. Like most, most of us are kind of left to fend for ourselves when we're figuring out how to navigate that. And the party line seems to be like to shake it off except that a lot of us have a lot of trouble doing that. Um, and so um, that's, I mean, I can talk about peer support all day too, because that's another passion of mine, but, <laughs> but developing programs where people um, actually themselves get training in how to support their peers. Um, I think not Both just listening. Because mm-hmm. part of our cultural problem and the evolution that you've highlighted, Gita, and that uh, Rachel has eloquently spoken to as well, is I've heard you both say, you know, when I made a mistake or my mistake, uh, and in ev- almost every case that I've reviewed, either through performance improvement or quality or in litigation, it's n- it's been multifactorial. I think mm. there has been a mistake. There has been an error. And I know that accountability is important. We shouldn't run from our actions. But everyone is so quick to say my mistake and own the whole thing. Mm-hmm. And maybe that's part of what we need to get away from so we can talk about it more. Listen in the, the, the strength of Rachel's comments. She's just like, you know what? I don't care where I'm at and who's at the table. I'm going to tell them about that CT scan. And I admire you, but that's rare. But if it's not your mistake, it's the hospital's mistake, it's the system's mistake, it's the mm-hmm. situation that you were put in, then maybe more people can come forward like you did. Well, Rachel has a lot of examples of her mistakes, so it's you know it's 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 easy, it's easy for her to do this. You know, I think it's embarrassing to be named in a lawsuit because uh, you um, would like to believe that you did the right thing, and some people's strength of character will say, "Absolutely, I did the right thing." But the fact of the matter is, is that there's a, a very skilled team who's going to say, no, you didn't do the right thing, doctor. And our mm-hmm. and our experts are going to say, you did not do the right thing, doctor. So it basically shatters uh, uh, and, and shakes our uh, confidence in ourselves. And mm-hmm. as noted uh, in your survey, doctors don't have a lot of confidence in themselves necessarily. Um, there is a lot of this imposter syndrome kind of thing that goes around, which I think frankly, is more real than more real than we know. Mm-hmm. I think that uh, many of us believe that um, when things are going well, I think we may tend to get a little cocky and uh, that we kind of think that we are, we, we, we got our game down and we know how to do this. And these things can come out of the blue and strike you and, and, and take the legs out from under you Mm-hmm. Any portion of your career, the beginning, middle, end, doesn't matter. Um, and one of the things, and Greg Henry used to say, say this, and I thought this is a, this is a great Greg Henryism, is that, um, and it reflects on how we feel our, about ourselves as doctors, and the importance of how we feel about ourselves as doctors. But he would say, uh, "You can call me a, a bad father." <laughs> You can call me a bad husband, but don't you dare call me a bad doctor. And I think that that in the in, in the hierarchy of things, we're willing to be bad fathers and bad husbands, but we're not willing to be called a bad doctor. Only Greg could make that sound like a good thing. I <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think it's a reflection of our egos in this. Yeah. Oh, a thousand percent. I totally, totally agree with you. And there is something singular about this, about the identity that we 
assume after all of this training and all of this work and all of this sacrifice and the ability when someone comes along and says that you are a bad doctor, um, there is really something very singular about what that does to your psyche. And I, you know, it's interesting, actually. So I have a question now for the lawyers here. So when I, you know, when I talk to people about this, I try to open their eyes to, you know, they get so angry at the plaintiff's attorney. They get so angry at like, how could they say this? How could they slant things this way? They get so mad at the experts. And it's it's very eye-opening for them sometimes when I say to them that I, I use the analogy of it being sort of like dealing with the borderline patient. You know, like someone's pushing your buttons. They're getting you so angry. You are getting worked up. And then all of a sudden you realize or you see in the chart like, oh, this person has borderline personality disorder. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh, oh, wait, like I don't have to. I don't get worked up about that. Like, that's just, that is what borderline personality patients do. Like, that's what they're supposed to do. Like, I don't have to be upset by this. So I can learn how to react, well, how to respond professionally instead of react emotionally. And so when, when I talk to people about this, I try to teach them about how, like, what the mindset is of a lawyer who goes to law school. Like, is it true that your job is to, no matter what, zealously defend your client by any means at your disposal, including if it requires the sort of psychological leverage when you understand what the other party is feeling and thinking. Like that's your job, right? But that's also your job on the other side where they basically know the psychology to attack you and make yes. you vulnerable. And that's, you that's to... what I mean. Like their job is to that their job is to make the physician feel tiny and small and bad at what they do They're The, the emotional manipulation is engineered into it, except that we don't understand it. Like there's no one saying like, Oh, this person has like this personality disorder or like, this is a set of rules that that person lives by. We just take it personally. Yes. I would like, that. I would agree with you. That's their, that's the lawyer's job is to, you know, make you question yourself and. And, yes. and even physicians are, high, you know, high functioning people. The idea that these people, these lawyers are going to your job is to, is to make you feel about two inches t tall and make it look like you're an uncaring jerk to the uh, jury. Um, but that is, that's going to happen to you, that that's what they're, they want to do to you. And um, that's a very, I think, uh, frightening kind of thing because they're quite probably quite good at it, and yeah. you don't you don't know how you're going to respond. Well, what's so I think there is. is a I lot think of the fear. average. Oh, I'm sorry, Rick. Were you? Did you finish your comment? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I, I think the average physician feels that the that the obligation of both attorneys on the plaintiff side and on the defense side is to find truth. That is not what this process is for. As was no. stated a moment ago, or a couple of moments ago, the attorney, yours and theirs, are to take the facts and defend their position for their client to the best of their ability. Truth may or may not be a part of that equation. It's to right. defend your client's position to the best of your ability. And part of that is, if you're the defendant, and maybe this helps, Gita, that every clinician defendant needs to know First, they're going to try and get you comfortable and be very nice to you. And then they're going to find avenues to destroy mm -hmm. your credibility in front of a jury, get mm -hmm. you to contradict yourself. And physicians are very smart. All clinicians are very smart. If you know the game, like you said, if we're playing, if we're playing handball instead of tennis, well, fine, we won't bring a racket. If that's what you're doing, that I'm not volunteering information. I'm not going to explain myself because I know you're not looking for truth. Right. And and I'm not going to give you the opportunity to discredit me. And if you know the game, you can play better. A thousand percent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That I mean, that's and so that's part of it. Like whatever we can do, getting back to Rachel's comment, like whatever we can do before that person gets their summons and complaint to get them in that mindset of, oh, when this happens, like I, I, I the way I think as a doctor is not the way I need to show up in this arena. It is a totally different arena and a totally different game. And maybe they won't know all the rules, but at least they know they're going to be playing a different game and they're going to have some rules to learn. 
Um, but I think that that it would it would just it, it would have been a lot better for me. Let's put it that way. <laughs> have you ever seen what happens to a plaintiff's counsel who thinks they have your number and publicly they can't get it done? It's spontaneous combustion. It is very interesting. To yes. Watch. Oh, I I know very well firsthand, um, as a matter of fact, because once you I mean, when I say I ask my residents to come like there, the difference between me testifying in my first trial versus my second, I mean, granted, I mean, it was like a social experiment with like an N of one, but like there was like trial one intervention trial B at trial B. Like I really did go from being my attorney. I had the same attorney the whole 12 years. Um, but did I told you have the I was, handler the second time. I've got to ask. I didn't. Uh, I, <laughs> the handler was still there. He okay. was still there, but he was no longer okay. like he okay. was not that necessary. You, you were consoling. <laughs> not you as were, necessary. You were consoling he, the handler now. Yes. <laughs> no. <laughs> he was take. He was taking your lunch order and getting your water and coffee. That's yeah. what he's doing now. He actually is on the podcast. He there's a, an, the episode about a deposition. I interview him about like what made me so bad, <laughs> what he had to do to and get how to be a handler. How to be a handler. He was like, it was, we made the joke that it was like my fair lady where, except nobody's old enough to know my fair lady anymore, but like just to turn me into like a regular dependent, like just to be able to actually perform. Um, and Who? so, it, yeah, right. <laughs> Rachel's like, what are you talking about? <laughs> and if someone told you about um, my fair lady, like a long time ago, you remember the <laughs> reference, right? <laughs> But um, it, it is it is really it, it is really something once you get like a certain skill set and enough knowledge where you realize like, oh, this is a game of strategy. Like I like I I can do this then. I mean, I don't want to say I don't want to say it's fun in any way, but you get a little competitive. Like you really do get to this point where you're just like, OK, like I know how to, I know every single thing in my case. I know all the points I want to hammer home and I know I know when to pay attention that this person is trying to lay groundwork to put me in a corner and nobody puts me in a corner. Um, and learning, how, learning. How that to is, is that, that is nearly a bumper was sticker in a set in of t-shirts. Nobody puts Gita in the corner. Nobody Damn. Puts Gita in the corner. <laughs> I show you. So, um, so really just like knowing how to handle yourself is so key. And it is, yes, I did get the opportunity to watch the plaintiff's attorney completely lose their, you know, just lose their composure. Cause you know, when they start getting angry and they're like coming at you with like their anger and like trying to badger you and like trying, you know, and you are returning that as cool as possible and just trying to be like this really nice human being that anybody listening would want to be their doctor, which is to my mind, the main, you know, the, that's, that's the end game. And they yeah. start losing their mind. They know, like they have lost it. The jury is not into that. They are not into that. And so, yeah, it's it's it is something. You know, I think that um, there is a natural fear of litigation uh, in all doctors, uh, particularly uh, and and starting out, young doctors have this fear of litigation that is often exaggerated, mm -hmm. and. Um, and you you don't want that fear to have them d do every test known to man um, and have a behavior in which they assume every patient is the enemy or potentially so. So mm -hmm. I think that there would also be a nice thing to do is to tell, to try to tell young doctors that, and uh, it may be difficult to get this message through, but this is just business. And just like you have car insurance, you buy this malpractice insurance. And yes, if you are the cause of a car accident, you feel badly. The insurance companies settle it all up. Uh, and although for the fact that there's no, they don't try to make you look like a jerk in that process, that's why you have insurance. And the insurance is to, is to handle these kinds of things. So it's not going to be, except for the fact that our system is um, adversarial, that uh, this is a, a normal occurrence in life, and you can expect it to happen. And, we're, and when it happens, 
We're going to teach you all about how to handle it. And we're going to make you real good at how to handle it. But don't let this fear, which is disproportionately um, affecting you, uh, uh, ruin how you practice medicine and take the joy out of practicing medicine. And I think that uh, I personally don't think I would go into all of the, a lot of the strategies and details. I would try to, to minimize this fear and angst at the beginning um, by and making an analogy to other kinds of insurance that you buy. Yes, your house burned down. It, 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 you're upset about it, but the thing is, it's going to get rebuilt. And um, so there, we buy insurance to cover all of these things. And this is just one other example of where insurance is going to cover these things. Um, Point, Rick, that I think Gita mentioned earlier too. Uh, the the initial demand in her claim was twenty eight million dollars, and stacked up against her measly million dollar um, uh, you know limit on her policy, that gets really scary. And I would just suggest, and I've suggested this to others before, when you're looking at employment opportunities as a clinician, I think you need to ask how they're going to handle excess limits judgments mm -hmm. and excess limits settlements. And if, if they're not willing to say that even maybe not put it in writing, but our history is that we do not expect clinicians to cover those. If you can't get that reassurance, then you need to be a little bit careful who you work for, because that can be very concerning in this current trend, which has been going on for several years now of, of increasing severity of claims. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that was, but I, I mean, there were lots of, lots and lots and lots of. Uh, but I remember Greg would say in the past on these over limit uh, claims that they don't want your house. They don't want your car. They, it, it's not their goal to make you destitute. I mean, they'd like to get it from somebody else with a deeper pocket, the hospital, somebody, you know, the person who designed the, uh, the, the curvature on the street, somebody, but for you to be expected to pay that kind of money when you certainly don't have that money uh, is like, um, it's, you, you can't get money out of a stone. No, no, but I guess, Rick, what I would say in response to that is you're right. They'd rather get it from somebody, but they're not going to forfeit if they can get it. Yeah, so I you don't want... the thought of it is leverage, right? Like, so, I mean, they they probably don't they don't expect that. They know I don't have twenty eight million dollars. Like, where is it going to come from? But I think you know, talking to physicians who have had, um, you know, threats of punitive damages, all sorts of stuff like that, they throw at them in an effort to get the physician to cave, to get them to say like, "I cry, uncle, I will settle." Um, I think that's part of the name of the game too, is like, how scary can you make this for the doc involved? Like how, like how close to their needs can you get them? Because most, I think, you know, the track record is that, you know, six out of seven times, if you wind up going to court, the physician's going to win. So uh, to my mind, I, I do think like, even though there's the risk of that, I, and certainly we know that there have been verdicts like that, even in my state, even most of the time I'm, I, I would guess, and I'm, I'm certainly interested to hear what you say about it. The, the goal is to get them to settle for the highest amount of money possible outside of court pretrial and using that as, as just psychological leverage. Fair enough. Rachel, you appear in deep in thought. You know, <laughs> I am not satisfied with the answer that, they're not oh. going to come after your homes on these excess limit verdicts and settlements. I am not sure that's true because well, if I were the defendant, I wouldn't want to, I wouldn't want to bank on that either, but right. But I, Greg you know, Henry wanna... said this say Greg Henry said, Oh, okay. I'm not going <laughs> to yeah. come after my well, house. I or think my we should cars. put that on our discussion points for, you know, next time and do a little digging in, in the interim because, uh, as a listener to Risk Management Monthly, I'm curious for a more definitive answer. So let's right. try to bring it next time. Oh, you okay. know where I stand. They are going to get what they can get. They'd rather not get it from you because they'll feel better yeah. about it. 
but they're going to get every bit that they can get for their client and themselves. So, right. And if I'm suing a doctor who's got a $2 million house and I had a, you know, $5 million judgment and they have a $3 million, um, you know, uh, whatever insurance and they're sitting in their $2 million house, I'll probably take their $2 million house, you know, if I can. I don't feel that bad. <laughs> oh my God, you know? look at her, you know. I'm just saying, tough, like, put yourself in their position. Are they really right. going to say, no, I feel bad for that doctor. I guess I'll walk away from $2 million? No. So I want to know what they can get their hands on. And I'm not convinced by the hearsay that we're talking about. So, well, so well, you I think are a licensed to- attorney and thank goodness you're using your skills for good and not for evil. Good. Please stay on our side. <laughs> Well, but she's going good back at, to what Kevin said, though, about um, when oh, actually, I'm going to lose my train of thought for a second. Um, when Kevin was talking about um, that, they 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 would come after your house, I believe, is what you were saying. And then you were saying that if you should talk to your um, policyholder about what they're going to do um, in situations where the verdict or the settlement exceeds their policy limits. Um, I think it would be really great for you to do an episode where you talk about um, consent to settle clauses, how physicians should know what their policy entails, what, you know, what might be a state by state variation um, for that. Because in my case, what eventually saved me is that I did have a consent to settle clause in my um in my policy, but I was allowed in in this state, you I could sign it away. And that made the insurer responsible for any excess, you know, any any uh, settlement or verdict in excess. If they decided to go to trial, in other words, and we lost, and it was greater than the limits of my policy, they were going to assume that loss. And that gave me, eventually, once we got to that point, it gave me a lot of peace of mind. Right. And it made it a lot easier to perform as a defendant because I wasn't worried about losing everything, including my shirt. Um, for the duration of the process, because I mean, really, like if you're asking this person to be like a cool, calm defendant and every single thing that they have in their life is on the line, um, it's just too big an ask. That can't happen. But finding ways to find reassurance in the process, I think, is instrumental to getting that physician wholly through the process and being able to perform as a defendant. Um but that I think would be very, very interesting for people because people don't know. They just don't know like what's, they don't know the questions to ask. They don't know what their rates are. They don't know what to expect. Right. I it's thought that was kind of topic. Yeah. I thought that was kind of the other way around in that um, sometimes physicians think that this is about a matter of honor and uh, they basically want to uh, have their day in court. But the insurance company, but the insurance company says, "Listen, um, we've got a, a decent offer. We're, we want to take it. Uh, if you want to go to court, and if it, the, the judgment is over this amount, it's your responsibility." That would scare the bejesus out of any doctor to go to court. It goes both think. ways. It goes mm-hmm. both ways, Rick, because you may say, listen, I want my day in court and you may want a clause that says you have the, you know, the the right to um, to they need your authorization authorization to settle. settle. Um, but, you know, I mean, you could first say I want to go and get my day in court. And, you know, what if they want to settle it? Well, are you aware that you are then potentially subject to a bad faith claim? Because if then you they try and settle it for half a million dollars and this thing goes for three million dollars at trial they would have settled it and so Mm -hmm. you have to kind of be careful of the circumstance you put yourself in and um so you can really see this conversation going either direction hey please settle it i won't well then you could say i would have settled it but the insurance company wouldn't they really wanted to defend it or the clinician being on that side of it. So really getting a sense of what your role is and where you want to be. And at the at the end of the day with that discussion is, well, what are you going to expect me to be responsible for, for financially if this doesn't go the way that we want it to go? And that's where we have to offload the burden from the clinician. Nobody intended, as I understand it, or and as, I, as I've experienced it, to have the clinician pay an excess limits judgment. But when it comes down to it, if there is one, and that, and that policy is your policy, whether it's purchased by your employer or it's provided by your employer, wherever it is, 
you are responsible for it unless someone offloads that responsibility from you. You know, I think that's one of the reasons some hospitals are now going three million, six million in terms of minimum insurance. But that another point of view on that is the insurance insurers know that your limits are higher and they're going to go for the limits. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. So you can speak to this. One of the first aspects of discovery are, are all available policies and limits. That's one of the first thing that happens. And if you, I think you're making a target on yourself by by getting higher limits policies. And I have some examples I can share with you maybe on another date, but well, that's um, a, where that has right. been, where, where it absolutely has happened. And then withdrawal of or canceling a policy like that had an, an equally opposite positive effect. Well, that's what Drake said. That was his advice is there's no point in really ratcheting it up because they're they're just going to go, they're, they're like, likely going to go to the limits of your policy. Yeah. Hey, one of the things I want to get out of this conversation, totally switching gears, is uh, the resources that physicians can get if they get named in a lawsuit. So yes. I have a friend who's getting sued and you know stressed about it. And one of the things they want to do is talk to somebody about it, not mm-hmm. their spouse, you know, somebody else. And you know, have been told obviously they they can't, but one of the exceptions per their understanding is a mental health professional. And they were referred to a coach, but then got freaked out because not sure if that actually qualifies as a mental health professional that would, you know, be safe to talk yeah. to. So can you weigh in on this? Sure, I can. And, oh, and then, um, so- sorry, as a secondary question, they were specifically interested in talking to a mental health professional that has like worked with physicians before. Is there such a network for people and how would they access that? Go. Mm-hmm. Cool. Okay, go. Cool. Uh, <laughs> all right. So uh, first resources. Uh, in general, there are um, there are not enough resources, but um, they can look at uh, professional society resources There is a website, I'm on their volunteer advisory board called physicianlitigationstress.org. It's the Sarah Charles uh, Litigation Stress Center. Um, I mentioned Sarah Charles earlier. So that's a place that has a lot. It's like a clearinghouse for other resources and things you can read and articles and stuff like that. There is a, um, a hotline that was set up during COVID for physicians who are in distress that wish to speak to psychiatrists. Um, I can get you that number. I think it's still functional. I don't know how long it's functional uh, for because it's a totally voluntary thing. I don't know if they're continuing it past the pandemic, but I do know physicians that have used that as like a safe thing to do to talk to a psychiatrist about a litigation related event. And they did. I've spoken to the person who um, I'll see if I can get you the number. But I spoke to the person who ran it. And at the time, she was very encouraging for physicians who felt distressed due to litigation to go ahead and call the hotline. That's not like a longitudinal solution in any way. There are books. I mentioned uh, one. But if you do a search on Amazon, there's you know a bunch of books about being a defendant and litigation stress and things like that. And I did find, you know, I read a handful of them. And I did find them very helpful. The therapist, coach, psychiatrist, thing. First of all, um, this is something that, um, like the Lord, the Dr. Lorna Breen foundation, Corey Feist, um, is working very hard. I think in Virginia, they're making real strides in making sure that, uh, that physicians who are in litigation, um, or for any reason who are seeking mental health have certain protections. That is something that we should be pushing for in every single state. Um, is it actually, uh, the truth right now? Uh, probably not. But there is a higher bar. I would say you probably know better than me, but there is supposed to be a higher bar for mental health records um, than other kind of records in these cases. Um, so it's, it's I, I encourage physicians who are in true distress, like if you're really, really highly depressed, I really would suggest that you speak to a therapist. I, I and I am a coach, um, but I think for the really, if you were really, if you were where I was, when you were thinking about suicide. You need a therapist. I don't give, you know, a rat's tail about what's discoverable. Like you need help. Who the hell cares? If you're like thinking about killing yourself or you're down the pills or having like, you know, two bottles of Chardonnay every night, who cares what's discoverable? Let's get you to be a human being who's not thinking about dying every day. Like that is, that is absolutely the bottom line. 
Like you need help. Let's get you help. We're not going to worry about what the lawyer is going to say about it afterwards. Okay. Like, let's just, let's start there. Barring that, um, if you feel like, you know, well, I've just been struggling with this for a while. Like I still think that therapy is generally safe in most states. You can talk to your lawyer if you want to about like how to make that happen. Like I, I paid cash. I don't know if that made any difference. I didn't put it through insurance, mm-hmm. but I started paying cash for my therapy. Right. Um, you did got I any I appointment had... you wanted. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's true. But um, I mean, I was, yeah, I don't know. I was nervous too, but like, I knew I needed help. Um, the coach versus uh, therapist thing is very interesting. So I would caution people to seek out a coach who understands this process. So now I have a pretty good relationship with the number of attorneys. I do, um, you know, I've done enough, like I just did a the keynote for a large insurance firms, like their law day and things like that. I now have lawyers who refer to me. Um, and so I have a good relationship with lawyers who understand what it is that I do. And then I understand how to take precautions because we don't talk about case details. Like I know in broad strokes, what, what any given person's case is about, but I don't take notes. I don't record our sessions. I don't, there are things that I bake into the process to protect the client. And we work on really just redefining mindset, figuring out how it is that we want to show up using the tools that you have at your disposal to move forward and find solutions to the things that are just <clears throat> making you really unhappy and uh, also a poor defendant. So I would, I think it's safe in those scenarios. I, I say that I'm a well-being coach for physicians in litigation. I'm not there to, to coach you as a witness. Um, that's very different. That's someone who should be hired by your attorney's team. Um, and also, I mean, I do like, I'll work with attorneys and see, if, you know, can you hire me? That's, it's different if I'm working with the attorney, but, um, I think you, I do think it's okay to use a coach. I do think that if you're suffering, you should see a therapist. I think that if you're really ill, none of those things, you should not think about one of those things. You just get the help you need. And then we'll figure out how to deal with it on the scene if we need to. And on that note, I think we should finish up uh any final thoughts uh rachel no not for me this is really helpful kevin just want to thank gita again for her courage in bringing this forward and helping others and sharing her thoughts her wisdom and experience on litigation stress so thanks gita yeah yes. thank, thank you, so, you much. so much it's great to hear being here. real story it, it's really great to see how your career ha- in this field has has blossomed. I mean, you've been really um, quite successful in getting known to be the the go to person in emergency medicine, and uh, and I'm sure other areas as well. And I think it's I think that the gentleness that you portray when you talk uh, allows people to feel comfortable around you. And I think that uh-huh. that's a, a really nice Thank asset. You. That is very very high praise coming from you, Rick. Thank you. Okay, guys. Thank you so much for having me. It, it's it's it was our pleasure. Next time, guys, we got cases. We got some uh, U.S. moves to bar not compete agreements and labor contracts. We've got states take action against nurses try who who buy their diplomas. We got all kinds of stuff uh, next time. Mm-hmm. So uh, until then, thanks so much for coming with us, Gita and. Uh, Kevin and Rachel, thanks as always.